Hello Trojans, we are coming at you with the coming attractions. This Sunday, it's going to be the third Sunday of Easter, we're going to be looking at the road to Emmaus, where the disciples were surprised that Jesus appeared right in their midst and that they recognized him in the breaking of the bread. That's coming up. But the past attractions, when we go back and we see where we were before, it's the wonderful story of Thomas. And Thomas is probably one of the best known disciples for his faith, but he didn't start out that way. In fact, he started out with a few doubts. And the story goes that all the disciples were gathered in a locked room. And it's kind of curious, why was that room locked? Think about that. You know, when I'm in a locked room, sometimes I do that for privacy. I don't want anyone to come in that door, so I'm gonna lock it. Or sometimes we lock our cars because we don't want someone to go through our car and take stuff. Or you might lock your home when you leave because you don't want a thief to come into your house. They were in a locked room, very curious. I wonder why it was locked. There's lots of different theories about that. Maybe the disciples were a little scared because they didn't know what happened to Jesus and they knew if they were caught as a follower of him, they might be led to a cross just like he was and put to death. And so they're thinking, well, they might have been a little scared, so they're gonna lock the door pretty sure they know who's coming in and who appears right through the locked door, but Jesus right in their midst. And the disciples tell the story about how he showed them his wounds and his hands, his glorified wounds and his side. And there wasn't any pain in his face. It was a glorified, beautiful thing to show the wounds of the cross to them. And they got back after this incredible experience to Thomas. And Thomas was like, oh, you guys are always the lucky ones. I'm never in the right place at the right time. How come I never get to see any of these things? They said, oh, Thomas, it was incredible. Jesus was right in our midst. He showed us his wounds. He goes, I'm not going to believe it. I'm not going to believe it unless I can touch that wound of his hand with my finger. If I can put my hand right in his side, then, then I believe it. Well, wouldn't you know? The disciples are gathered again, but Thomas is right there with them this time. And they're in a locked room. Jesus appears in their midst again. And what does Jesus do? He says, Thomas, come here. I want to show you something. And there he says, touch my wound in my hand. Touch my side. And Thomas has one of the best lines in scripture. He says, my Lord, my God. Kind of like, what was I thinking to even throw a doubt your way? You are so wonderful. I'm going to trust in you with all my life. Wonderful act of faith. You know, these are some of the important scriptural stories that we want to get you in, 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 uh, in touch with. And that's why we do these reflections on our Sunday scriptures. You know, before you ever have a test, I want you to take an opportunity to learn one of our Franciscan great saints is St. Joseph of Cupertino. And we have, a, we have a, a prayer for you to say before that big project, before that big exam, before that quiz, so that you can remember the good things you're being taught. And the prayer goes like this. O oh, Joseph of Cupertino, who by your prayer obtained from God to be asked at your examination the only answer you knew. See, he only studied one question, and that's the one that they asked him on the exam. It says, grant that I may, like you, succeed in my history exam, or algebra exam, or math, or social studies, or religion exam. And I, re in return, I promise to spread your cause and make you better known. Oh, St. Joseph of Cupertino, pray for me. Oh, Lady of Consolation, prepare me. O oh, sacred head of Jesus, seat of divine wisdom, enlighten me. Amen. This is a prayer that you can say right before your homework, right before your exam. St. Joseph of Cupertino was known as the flying saint. He had the gift of levitation. He also had the gift of studies. So he's the patron saint of students like you that are studying. And before we go, I want to uh, put you in touch with um, some reflection questions you can take to your family as a way to break open those rich scripture stories of Thomas.
first off, we have um, our favorite character. What's her name, Friar Tom? Dolly. Dolly, that's right. Dolly is looking at this beautiful Easter lily, and she asked the question, how do Easter lilies know what date to open up their flowers? Isn't that funny? They're so consistent. They're always opening up right on Easter, those Easter lilies. They've got a great biological clock. So the first reflection question we have on our readings this last week is, have you ever gone to a room and locked the door? Yes or no? Two, why did the disciples gather in a room and lock the door? Hmm. Thomas, number three, Thomas missed out on Jesus's first visit. Why do you think Thomas was not present with the other disciples? Hmm. This may take a little imagination. Why wasn't Thomas there in the beginning when Jesus visited the first time? Number four, Jesus appeared in the disciples' locked room again. Only this time, Thomas was present. How do you think the tone of Jesus was toward Thomas? Do you imagine Jesus speaking to Thomas like an angry person or like a loving friend? Hmm. I like to use your imagination there too because we don't know the tone of the words, right? Sometimes people say words that are when they're angry at us. Sometimes people say words when they're in love with us. They're very kind. Number five, last question. How did Thomas respond to his doubt about Jesus? And you can look that up in John chapter 20, verse 28. That has the answer. Again, that's John chapter 20, verse 28. How did Thomas respond to his doubt about Jesus? There you have it. Some wonderful reflection questions to get you closer in touch with our rich scriptures that we have every Sunday when we come to Mass. I can't wait till we get to be together again at Mass. Um, We have a pew reserved just for you. I'm looking forward to that day. And I like to say, be a saint. What else is there? And by the way, Friar John is really looking forward to hearing your answers. Hey, Friar, what you doing on the floor? Well, what I'm doing is I'm going to show all of you kids some of the saints that we have here. Um, I'm going to explain just a little bit about each one because we don't have too much time. So I'm going to start her. This is St. Barbara. St. Barbara, sadly enough, was turned Catholic, but her father was pagan, and it was her father who killed her. So she died for love of Christ. That's why she has the sword. See this little tower? I'm going to show you this little tower here, okay? See how many windows it has? One, two, three. Well, when Barbara's father heard about her becoming a Christian, he imprisoned her in a tower. That's why it's shown in a tower. And she had such a love of the Holy Trinity. See, we have the three windows, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. If you notice, she's wearing a palm. Anytime you see a statue with a palm, that means she's a martyr. She died for the faith. So that's St. Barbara. Next, We're going to talk about this saint. This is a saint that many of you probably don't know much about. Her name is Saint Philomena. Philomena comes from a Greek word which means lover of God. She was discovered in the catacombs long after she died. Hence, you can see she's also a martyr. She has the palm. She was put to death by being shot full of arrows. The lily means that she lived a very pure and holy life. Saint uh, John Vianney, who was the patron saint of priests, had a great devotion to Saint Philomena. So this is Saint Philomena. We'll talk more about her later. Now who's this guy? This guy is Saint Thomas More. Saint Thomas More, as you can see, has this chain around his neck. What does that mean? Henry VIII, who was the King of England in uh, about in the early 1500s to the middle of the 1500s, 
made him Lord Chancellor, which was the most powerful position after the king. So he was given this necklace to wear. This white thing signifies that he is a doctor of the law, and this is a law book. He was a very holy man, and he's the patron saint of lawyers. He and Henry VIII were the best friends until Henry VIII decided that he was going to be more important than the Pope or the Holy Father. And St. Thomas More stood up and said, I am the king's good servant, but God's first. And so he put the church ahead of the state. He put an earthly king ahead of his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and respected his vicar on earth, who is the Holy Father. He was martyred for his faith in 1535. This is one of my favorite saints. Notice what St. Lucy's got. See the little eyes in the dish? St. Lucy was a martyr too. You can see the palm here. St. Lucy was uh, put to death by having her eyes taken out for her faith. So she suffered greatly. When she died, before they buried her, they, find, they found that her eyes had been miraculously restored. Anybody who has eye trouble, you pray to her. This is St. Jude, one of the most popular saints in the Catholic Church. St. Jude is the patron of people who have lost hope. Why is that? First of all, St. Jude was the last of the apostles to be chosen not to be confused with Judas, although he took Judas's place. So his name was also Jude or Thaddeus, which means someone who loves God. And as we see, he has this medal of Christ because he mirrored the presence of Christ. He has a walking stick because he went to Armenia, which is kind of near Turkey today. He, he spread the gospel and was, of course, martyred for his faith. But St. Jude is very popular, and um, I think it'd be kind of interesting if you can tell me where his statue is, the big statue in the lower church. We're going to just do a couple more because time does not permit. One of my favorites, this is Kateri Tekawitha. She is called the Lily of the Mohawks, again because of her purity and her kindness. She was someone who was of royal blood and then taken away and lived with the Hurons for a while. She was somewhat poorly treated as a servant, but with her perseverance and her love of Jesus Christ, she converted many of her Native Americans to the faith. She is the patroness of North American, uh, North American Natives, North America being Canada and the United States. Last but not least, we have, and this is where I'll stop today, one of my favorites, Saint Martin de Porres, or as we call him in Spanish, San Martin de Porres. Saint Martin was born in Peru, in Lima, Peru, in the 17th century. He, his father was a Spaniard, and his mother was African. He was very poor, and he wanted to become a Dominican friar. And so he just kept persisting and persisting and persisting, and the community took him in. But they thought that he wasn't very smart. So what they made him do is answer the door and sweep the floors. In Spanish, he's called Fray Escoba, which means in English, Brother Broom, because all of the humblest tasks were performed by him. He also had a great love, as you can see, of cats and dogs. He was always feeding all the stray cats and dogs uh, of Lima. So he's kind of a little bit like St. Francis. He wears the Dominican habit. You can see the white habit. But also as a brother, because he wore a black, what we call scapular, that's this piece of material here, and not a white one. So that's all for today, folks. I know I've given you lots of information. Uh, but next time, what I'd like you to tell me and you can write to Father uh, Friar John about this, is who is your favorite saint of what I've talked about? Also, the big question of the day, what is this, what's it called, 
please send your answers in to Friar John. Thank you so much for being with us today, and we hope you're all doing well, and we miss you a lot.